The DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present. It is the DJ Bob Show. DJ Bob here. And we are back with our second and final part of our conversation with the folk behind the music of Blue's Clues and you. This time we are joined by the theme song composer, Peter Zizzo. A lot of valuable information in this one. How we got the idea stylistically for the theme song, writing kick music in general, and a lot of just fun nuggets that I think are valuable to all creative people and just people in general. Enjoy this one. Writing a theme song is hard because it plays every episode and you don't want it to be this annoying thing where the parents are sick of it and the kids love it. So how do you find the balance? (laughs) Well, (laughs) um, that's a little luck of the draw. I mean, hopefully, you know, something that you think is fun and catchy won't ultimately be found sound annoying to people. Sometimes that just happens whether you like it or not. Um, You know, I think what you really want to do is try as much as possible to capture the spirit of the show. So if you love the show, the song should get you in the mood for the show. The song should make you excited about the show that you're about to see. It should, it should remind you of the feelings you have about the show. Like as an adult, if I hear old songs from say Sesame street or electric company or some of the shows that I loved when I was little, those songs just put me right back there, put me right back there in the feeling of the whole show and the stories that I told and the images that I got to see and the characters that I fell in love with. So I think you really just want to, you, you want to try to come up with something that captures the essence of the show itself. And then hopefully, you know, uh, it won't be annoying unless the show is annoying to the parents. <laughs> well, you know, it de- like you said, it depends. Yeah. I mean, if the, if the parents don't want to watch the show, they're probably not going to like the theme song either. <laughs> <laughs> because most times in King TV, Sometimes you hear this kitty sound. Yes. Where it's not pandering, but it's kind of like cute and sing songy. Yeah. That's not what this is. <laughs> no, and honestly, I think one of the one of the reasons that um, I originally got into this, you know, I was approached originally by Doug Cohn, who is a, a talent executive at Nickelodeon. And he had um, originally been at Atlantic Records. I had a joint venture with them years ago when he was the head of the video department. So, I, you know, we had a, a relationship there and he, he remembered me. I think what they like about what I do is that I really bring just a full on pop songwriting sensibility to kid songs. So I'm not, you know, I'm not kind of a, a kid songwriter. I'm a, I'm a pop songwriter that that tries to do something that's fun. And I think just if I imbue with my spirit, the song that I write and I understand the show, I think it's automatically going to hopefully straddle that line between, you know, being a kid song, but also being like a pop song. So that like the parents go, Hey, you know, I kind of like this too, but obviously you don't want it to be too edgy, but I, I know what you're talking about. And I, by the way, I, I think kid songs are awesome, but that's not what they would ever come to me for it. It's not, it's not something that you know. Yeah. Like I, like, that's what a lot of the Sesame Street stuff was. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you mind sharing with us, kind of like, because the song, the theme song is so, like, uh, production heavy. Would you mind sharing some of those tricks mm-hmm. and stuff that you used to make it sound? Yeah. Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm... I'm... I'm flattered that you're you're noting the production because to me that particular track um, it, it was was sort of a it was a kind of case where I sort of figured it out as I went along because Blues Clues is such a unique show and its previous incarnation had had such a specific musical vibe. It was this sort of jazzy improv, very quiet, mellow but like fun, uh, kind of a, kind of a thing. And it felt very loose, very much like a few guys in a room, but what they were looking for this time was a little of that, but also have it sound contemporary. So in the brief that I got, there were, you know, there was 
you know, pay homage to the original sound, but also this is here's Shut Up and Dance, you know, the recent pop hit as another example of something we like. So and then there are a few other things, but it was it was a wide variety of of reference songs. So I sort of went for initially uh, for some reason I was thinking almost of like a, a modern day kind of Fleetwood Mac. And so I, I wrote it on an acoustic guitar and uh, as I got into writing it, I started, I started thinking that like almost a bluesy sort of a vibe would be fun in the verses. So in the verses, it's a bit of a blues chord change, except it starts on five instead of the one. Now I'm getting into the weeds with musical terminology, but then I kind of wrote that little, which is a little bit of a Stevie Wonderish kind of a bass line um, that I thought was fun and a little kind of like the jammy old, old blues clues thing. But really I, I sort of ended up bouncing around the room with pencils, like banging on like lights and like LaCroix soda cans. And, and, and I may, and then like, playing my acoustic guitar with my hands as like a, as a percussion instrument. And I built out a groove with just these natural elements, like in the room elements. Um, and that was sort of what got the, the energy of the song going. And it just sort of, as a songwriter, when you get into a zone and you're just kind of trying to figure it out, in a way you sort of lose all of the references and the stuff that you're trying to do. And you just sort of start following a path and, and, and you have to rely on your, your own tastes, like what strikes your fancy. It's like, oh, I like this chord change. Oh, I like this melody against this chord change. And eventually you, you usually end up with something that sounds like something you would do because you're just, you're just as a songwriter, you specifically are attracted to certain things. So I think at the end of the day, it just ends up sounding like something that you would do. And, and one of the things I love about writing songs for Nickelodeon for projects like this is because I really feel like they're coming to me because they thought of me and what I do. Whereas in the pop world, what I'm used to, used to doing, you're more trying to fit in what's popular. You're more trying to look at, okay, what are the top songs on Spotify? What are the biggest songs on the radio? I have to be very mindful of what the snare drum sounds like or what kind of uh, kick drum I'm using or what uh, is electric bass popular or is it more of a Moog thing these days or is it EDM or should it be more hip hop? And you're, you're trying to fit yourself into something. Whereas with, with something like this, you just get to rely on your own pop instincts and what you love to write. And that's one of the reasons I really love doing this. I get to be a pop songwriter, but I get to kind of be me. And so at the end of the day, this really just feels like a song that I would write. And that's, that's why I was proud of it at the end of the day. But in terms of the production, I really just sort of wanted it to almost have like a, an organic but modern thing. So, you know, it's all me on it, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think hopefully it just ends up sounding like produced and contemporary because my instincts just sort of led it there, you know, without any specific sort of evil plan to have it be like anything in <laughs> to have it be like anything in particular. I think that my, my natural instincts are, are kind of contemporary, you know, even though I'm 180 years old. So hopefully like it still works. I'm not really 180, by the way. I'm 143. Right. So, so one of the things that I noticed about the track was like stacks and stacks and stacks of background vocals. Mm. Yes. And, uh, yes. I really liked the yeah. gang vocal in the chorus. Yes. What you process of adding like the little minute details that people wouldn't hear um you know that's sort of an instinct that you develop over time uh but that's a very smart observation on your part that it that i was going for a gangy kind of a thing um in fact it's funny when i was finishing it i you know in going through all the backgrounds i noticed that there were some lyrics that were wrong and <laughs> some things that had changed but the old thing was still in there and in some cases, I even just left it because, you know, someone in the gang is going to be getting it wrong, right? Not everyone's going to be a perfect singer. Uh -huh. You know, when I do gangy vocals and I'm like a lot of times the only singer, um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll change my voice. You know, I'll do one where I sound like me or a few where I sound like me, a, a few where I, I kind of sound like this. And then like I'll do one with an English accent or then I'll do like a really low one like that. And I, and it's really wild because then you just put them together. And it just sounds like, even though individually it sounds really silly, it, as, as a group, it actually just sounds like this gang of people. And it's just sort of a mindset where you have to be a little uh, more allowing for imperfections and just 
be a little more shouty, be a little less perfect. Like, you know, like for a background part, like the, and you, so I can, you know, like that's gotta be perfect. That's gotta be a perfect little, like little, you know, Gladys Knight and the Pips kind of a thing. But the other stuff definitely has to be uh, gangy. Um, there's a lot more background vocals than it sounds like. And what you have to also be confident enough to do is not all of them need to be heard. Um, they're just, it just, even having them almost inaudible actually adds dimension to it. And it gives it a feel of depth. And that's, uh, that's just a matter of just like mixing it carefully. And especially once we had Josh there, because it still has to sound like he's leading the thing. So there's a gang, but he has to be very much in front of that gang as the lead vocal. So, um, Oddly enough, even for a gang, when you're going for a gang thing, it's kind of a specific approach. It's specific in its looseness, right? Those are just fun things that I notice because I'm a production guy, so I can pick those things apart. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting, like, for things like the, the quote-unquote live drum sounds, I really did something that I don't normally do, which is I just, I really went with a very stock drum kit from um, uh, a soft synth called Contact, and I really just grab something from their library as like a temporary thing, just to kind of put down a groove with the intention that I was going to replace it with more specific snare kick kit kind of a kind of sounds that I would pull from other things that I have. Um, and I just ended up really liking the way it sounded, you know, and I just, I just decided to just go with it. And, um, you know, it's funny, I was talking to PT uh, about this and he commented on that. The drums sounded really good. And it's just so often the case where I've I've liked something that someone else did and specifically pointed out a sound and they'll go, oh, that was like just a stock thing that I wasn't even going to keep. But because you as the producer can tell when something works right, it's important to trust that notion because not only does it work right, but to other people, even people that are experts, quote unquote, at this, they're going to pick out that thing as one of the things they really like about the track. And then it'll be, it'll be the moment where you go, well, actually that was just a stupid thing that I was just using as a, you know, honestly, the, 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 the story behind a lot of big hit records that you'll hear is that, Oh, that vocal was just the, the practice vocal. We, we, we didn't even have the levels right, you know, or uh, yeah, that was actually the, the demo. We re recorded it five different times and then we just went back and used the demo. Um, I love stories like that. So I think it's important as a producer to, you know, not only be careful about the sounds you use, but also be careful to not overthink it and to go with a vibe and go with a feel, even though you know that what you're using is something that you ordinarily wouldn't commit to. You know what I mean? Yep, definitely. Yeah. So there's yeah. the TV version of the theme song, and then there's the, the one that came out long. The longer version. So what was done, what was done first? And did you add on to the original later, or...? Yes. Yeah, so uh, usually, you know, you, you write a song and then it's edited to be shorter for a situation like this. But uh, the truth is that uh, what plays at the opening of the show, the 30 second thing is that's the song that I wrote. That's the song that I pitched um, with very little that was changed. I think there was one thing that they wanted, one word that they wanted me to, to take out. So I, I did. And um, and then they came back and said, hey, so we, we want to do like a 60 second version and a 90 second version. And so then I went back to it and just figured out a way to make it 90 seconds. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that they wanted was a way to, uh, to bring in the names of the characters. So I created this sort of rap section in the second, I mean, rap, I use the term very loosely, in the second verse to accommodate all the names of the characters. It was an inc that was the hardest part of, of, of this whole thing was figuring out a way to incorporate you know, tickety tock, slippery soap, shovel and pail, Mr. Salt, Mrs. Pepper, cinnamon, paprika, magenta. There were so many characters and they all have like three or four syllables in their names. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's only 90 seconds. The first pass I did was, um, Hey, it's really cool, but it's, you're, you're saying all the names so quickly that we, we won't have time to show them like the visual, we can't match the visual to it. Mm, and yeah. so then I had to, then I had to slow it down and then they're like, Hey, we like this better, but can you add also these two characters? And then it was, can you then add these? I, I don't remember who it was at first, but they kept adding to, <laughs> to, and I think, I think cinnamon and paprika were the last two that they added. And, you know, now when I listen to it, it sounds like the simplest thing in the world. But... And, it, and it works too. It works too, because it's almost like Josh for Gek. Yeah. Magenta. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And also like I had to, I had to come up with a way to do the names in an order where they almost sort of rhyme 
like the cinema paprika and hay magenta. Like I had to, I had to figure out an order to do them where, you know, the sound of the, it's really important when you write lyrics that the words flow you know? and they don't always have to rhyme perfectly, but they have to, they have to land in a way that's satisfying. So sometimes it's a, it's a near rhyme or it's a sound alike word that doesn't rhyme, but it's cool. Um, and in this case, I had to kind of figure out a way to order the names in a way that, that just kind of rolls off the tongue. Right. Yeah, and, I um, that's why like for somebody like to me, there was never any doubt that tickety talk was going to be the first name. Cause that just, that's just cool. That just sounds like a, something out of a, a, a classic hip hop song, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, so it was, a, yeah. So then I did the 90 second one. Then there was a 60 second one. That's a little different than the 90 second one. It just has a regular second verse. Uh, lyrics are a little different. I don't know that that version has ever been completely aired. Um, but it's also really cool uh, as well. I hope we can hear that sometime soon too. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. And then I had to. I made the chorus a little longer, right? I said, uh, step by step, clue by clue, think it through. That's what we do. So let's get to it. Um, which is what I, you know, I added that little end part. Um, but yeah, it, it actually worked out really nicely, and it timed out nicely to the ninety seconds. I honestly found, you know, it's not always that much fun to work with production on songs. Sometimes. They have a real tough uh, time explaining what they mean so that you understand it as a musician, and it can be very confusing, or sometimes they'll ask you for something lyrically that's just almost impossible to do. Um, and in this case, I just found the whole process with them, uh, and I think it shows in how good the show is, that they just had such a clear idea of what they wanted and why they wanted it, that it just sort of like recruits you into the same enthusiasm, where even though you might have loved what you gave them, Within like a minute, you go, oh, okay, no, that would be really cool if I could do that, you know? Yeah. It's really cool because I think the show has premiered. I've met people and fans of the show, and they treat this theme song as part of the Blue's Clues universe. Like, it's not That's great. a reboot. It's just there. That's great. Like, it's a part of the fold, and I do too. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, one one of the reasons that means a lot to me is because, um, and I haven't said this enough, um, when I got invited to pitch for the theme song, one of the things I was worried about was I'd actually never really seen the show. You know, I was sort of, I'm 53, and so, and I have kids, and just sort of the era that the show was on, we just sort of all missed it, just in terms of the the, the time frame of our lives. We just sort of missed the, the Blue's Clues thing. Um, and I, I knew about it. I obviously was very aware of it, and I'd seen snippets of it and clips of it, and I knew about Steve, and I, I knew what the general show was. But I wasn't you know, as in the, as in the sort of mind frame of, of, of what the feeling of the show was. So I had to kind of catch up quickly. And I worried that I wouldn't bring, like, the right spirit to the song because I hadn't been with my kids where they were watching it every day or obviously I wasn't young enough that I would have been a kid when it was on watching it. Um, so it was really, I was really hoping that what I wrote would, would feel like the show. It's actually really funny. One really ironic thing is that, you know, I started writing the lyric and, and I had, you know, have you seen my job? He's looking for you too. And in watching some clips, I, I realized that Blue was a girl. And one of the things that's really interesting is that now when I've looked at some of the comments about the song from people that were huge fans of the show, a lot of them never realized that Blue was a girl. Yeah. I especially didn't know that 20 plus years ago when I was watching the thing. Yeah. So <laughs> it makes sense. It's... I mean, it makes sense. And, um, but, I, but I remember thinking like, oh my God, thank God I caught that because like right out of the gate, I would have had like the gender of the dog wrong. <laughs> I would have probably would have been out of the running right there. Um, so, yeah. I love it. Kids love it. I've shown it to a bunch of kids in the process and they love it. That's great. Like it's really great. That's great. Well, I, you know, I've said that, you know, writing songs for children's television, when I get to see like a video of like a, a little kid in like Australia bopping around to a song that I wrote for the Fresh Beat Band, let's say, it, it's as exciting to me as finding a video of like Celine Dion singing a song that I wrote that she did, you know what I mean? Or, or, or seeing a video or, or, or seeing a song of mine on the charts. It, it's, it's the same kind of validation, the idea that, because when you create, um, and anybody can attest to this, when, if you're a creator of stuff, 
but music or stories or TV or whatever, it, it, to a certain degree, you're, you're in a vacuum. You're by yourself. It's a, it, it can be a very lonely process where, it, it, and especially because I don't collaborate on these songs. I do them completely by myself. So there's no one for me to bounce off, uh, off of. And so every decision that I make, I worry that maybe it's the wrong decision. And, I, and you really have to learn to trust your instincts and also to question them and to be willing to throw everything up in the air and start over and not fall in love too easily with your ideas. Um, and um, that's, that part's taken me a long time, a long time to do. But um, it's such a validating thing when you finally you put what you did, you know, with the door closed in your little room out there and it gets a response like this has so far, it just completely validates, you know, maybe all of the, the previous stretch of time that you weren't winning these things or you weren't doing well, or you weren't able to monetize your work. Um, and I would say for anyone that, that creates like a really nice moment for me with this thing was the night that I found out that I got it. Um, I was with my son who's 23 and he's moved out here about a year ago and he's an incredibly gifted uh, singer, songwriter, producer, um, you know, and so he and I are very close and we relate a lot on a musical level and I'm hugely supportive of him, but you know, he, he's scared. I mean, he's just out of college. He's out here struggling, getting like kind of day work and he signed to a manager and he's just trying to make things happen. He started his website. He's worried that he's never going to be successful. And he knew that the year that I got this leading up to that, I had pitched for a bunch of things that I didn't get. And it can get nerve wracking after a while when you, if, if you lose a bunch in a row. So the night that I got it and he got to see what it meant to me and how happy it made me, I said to him, you know, pay attention to my reaction to this because this moment takes care of all the doubts that you had leading up to it. And, and then when you go on another stretch where maybe you're not winning and you're working and working and maybe things aren't lining up for you, you have that memory of when you won always in front of you that this next thing could be the thing. And so you always want to give it your absolute best because you never know when you're going to nail it, you know? And, and truthfully, the reason that you don't nail it isn't because you didn't do great work. It's because what they specifically need just isn't what you did. Like I, I just had an experience where I pitched a, something for Netflix and uh, it didn't go, but it made very clear to me that the producers of the show were obsessed with the song. They had it on the playlist. It just didn't fit the scene that they needed the song for. Um, and so I just kind of like to use this when I talk to other people that are creative is like, you know, don't presume that these things come easily. They come really hard and, totally. and, and they come rarely, like really rarely for even the best of, of, of us. Even like a podcaster, like what I do, like completely, you have to, like, I mean, you have to like cut through so much noise to get where you are. Yeah. I mean, I've probably pitched to at least 25, 30 different shows over the last five, six years, um, theme songs. And I've won four of them. And to me, that's, you know, that's, that's almost a 10 to one ratio. And I hear that that's really a good ratio, but it, it can be very nerve wracking when you're a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you still haven't won. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, again, it's important to remember when that, that every once in a while you do get one and, um, and that it's everybody's experience when you create, yes, whether it's a podcast or like I said before, any creator, anybody that's trying to do anything from nothing, from a standing position, um, the ones that succeed are the ones that just have an endless appetite for it. The ones that succeed are the ones where there is no other option for them. This is what they're going to do until they succeed. And that's, that's kind of how you have to be. You know, if you do, like, if I had given up after songs one, two, three, four, five, six, I, I, probably a lot of people around me wouldn't have blamed me, right? And I wouldn't have known that seven, eight, nine, ten would have would have been like the big win. I never got there because I gave up, you know? And I think it's really important, you know, with things like this, if you love it enough, then you always have to just do it and to get give it your best. Pay attention to the energy you're getting back. Like it's important to stay true to yourself and not just compromise and just do whatever anyone else tells you to do. But it's also important that if you're hearing a lot of the same note in a row from different people, that there's probably something to it and you need to take a look at it. Right? Like if, if, if one person says, hey, your production's too complicated, it's really distracting from the vocal, and say, well, screw you, right? then you just don't get what I do. 
But then like the next three people yeah, say that yeah. too, then maybe you need to take a look at, at your production approach and you might want to, you know, but some people, people that are defensive about stuff like that are generally scared, you know, and it's, um, it's such a freeing feeling when you allow yourself to just be like, yeah, you know what? You're right. There's way too much crap going on here. Let me, let me, let me, let me see what I can get away with. It's actually fun to, to see what you can get away with removing from your production and having it still work or having it work even better because there's more space. It's like it's like does this piece of music make sense here or right you know yeah but then like with Blues Clues I really wanted the, the the track to be kind of busy because I wanted it to sound kind of like a party I, I wanted it to sound like mm-hmm. just a bunch of people just banging around just have totally has party. that vibe yeah like I I didn't want it to sound like a like a Max Martin record you know I I, I wanted it to have. I don't want to say Dave Matthews, but I wanted it to just have just sort of a fun, so, so celebratory. Uh, I heard spirit. Spin Doctors in it personally, but sure, like that yeah. kind of like. Yeah, I I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, like the the, 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 the the drum sounds. That, that that drum set has a little bit of a of a '90s Spin Doctors drum kit, like that. The the, the, the snare cracks. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I I could totally see that. I just want to thank you for talking with us and. Kind of delving deep into this. Of course, yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. I was looking forward to it, man. I'm, I look, I love hearing myself talk, <laughs> and I love, uh, I love when people like what I do, you know. And I think it's important to provide sort of some insights into that. Like we all suffer for our successes, and it's important that you that you do that gladly, and you do that knowing that there is a success up ahead. And, there's a certain amount that you can't control when you create something. Um, you don't know what your best work is. Uh, the world, the universe will tell you what your best work is. You might have your personal feelings about it, but you just never know when you're going to connect. So you just got to keep showing up. Perfect. Thank you so much. Of course, Bob. My pleasure. The DJ Bob Show. DJ Bob Show. Pop culture, past and present.